So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is John Florine. I'm going to be talking about Android in short, specifically the way that we replaced the Java layers of Android with an environment of our own. All right, a little bit of uh, background about me. I am uh, trained as a computer engineer at RIT. Um, I work for Sandia National Labs in California. That's a Department of Energy lab. Um, I work in high performance computing. I've also started doing some research into mobile and the security. And uh, so as it says there, I, uh, I like doing open source stuff and most of my coworkers do as well. Is this too loud? Okay. I thought I was hearing a little feedback. Okay. But and so a, lo a lot of my coworkers and I, we really do like working in the open and so uh, projects like this really make us happy where we can take what we do and put it back out to the community. So yeah, smartphones. Um, probably everybody here has one or damn near. And uh, my first thought when I got one was, oh yeah, great, I've got a PC in my pocket now and I guess it can also make phone calls. And they're, they're sort of better than the old, PDA, the old PDA model which was you had a computer in your pocket but unless you had the Wi-Fi card then you couldn't talk to the internet or anything like that. And it's got a bunch of nice sensors like the camera, the GPS, the accelerometer. And so, you know, there's a lot of people just use it for everything now, right? Uh, my girlfriend is, I mean, it, she's a biochemical engineer and she hasn't actually opened her laptop in months. She just uses her phone for everything. Um, I'm not quite at that stage, but uh, a lot of us, I think, are getting closer. Uh, you can use it to manage your passwords, do two factor authentication, uh, pay for stuff. So they're really uh, becoming very ubiquitous, kind of this ubiquitous uh, computing platform that we've been talking about for so long. But the problem with smartphones uh, in terms of, you know, being a hacker, wanting to hack on them, is that most of them are closed source to begin with. You look at the Blackberry, the iPhone, the Windows phone, you're not going to get the source to those. Uh, and there's some, uh, some security issues with these. Uh, there's been a few incidents where it's, uh, RIM has indicated that they're willing to decrypt users' uh, text messages to each other for the government. Uh, I think that happened recently in London after the riots. Um, we've seen the iPhone maintains a, a record of all the cell towers you come into contact with, meaning that they know your position and store it on the phone. And there's been incidences of, say, a security holes like a DOS attack. You could uh, do a denial of service on someone's smartphone by sending SMS. Uh, the Windows Phone, well, nobody really has one. There's probably a few in this audience, but that's it. Uh, they also had a similar denial of service via SMS messages. And uh, of course they're closed source as well. And then I don't know how many people heard about the Carrier IQ event some time ago. And that was, well, that was a lot of different phones. I mean, I think that was on, I think it was on the iPhone, if I remember right. It was on Android. Uh, I don't know, if, I don't even know if Windows has enough micro share to actually have been affected by that. Uh, but so there's, there's some security issues, some privacy issues and all these uh, devices. And uh, Android, I was really excited when I heard about Android. Right? I thought, oh great. So it's Linux based, it's open source, you can download the entire source online. Um, as we've seen now, there's a huge proliferation of devices all the way from the free things that AT&T gives you up to, you know, $500 tablets and, you know, even better. Uh, you can write your own applications, unlike the iPhone, there's no fee to get started on it. You just download the SDK and go, like, go from there. Uh, you can even hack the OS if you want. It's just Linux with you know, Android, the open source Android on top. And there's a, a really big community of it. There's a lot of mailing lists, there's a lot of people interested in Android development. Uh, so, that, you know, so it's very, when I, when I heard about it, I thought, great, this is a really great platform for hacking on. But uh, then I actually started playing with it. And you know, I said, I have to use what language? I, I can use Java and or C++ with JNI. And I, I, I apologize to the Java lovers, but I really want to gouge my eyes out when I use it. Uh, and um, yeah, half of most of my coworkers who are they're very interested in Android, but they really they don't know anything about they don't know Java. They're C programmers. They're C++ programmers, uh, Ruby, Python, all these things. But those aren't really good options. I mean, you can get like Python with scripting language for Android, but still kind of a second class citizen in the Android environment. Um, besides programming, uh, the vendors don't really have any incentive to up keep updating your OS on your old phones. You've bought it, 
they're not going to get any more money out of you, and they'd rather in a year you go buy a new one anyway. And then, because we're paranoid people, I mean, how much do you really trust that Joe Random on the XDA forums, who has just said, "Here's a, you know, here's a, here's a uh, ROM I just cooked up." Do you really want to trust him? Maybe he probably didn't put Carrier IQ on there. He's probably more trustworthy than uh, AT and T. But I mean, who knows? Who knows what's in there? And uh, Android, uh, like the other devices, uh, has some security problems. In fact, I think I've seen more issues with Android uh, talks here, um, stuff on the news, uh, than, than with the other phone uh, phone OSs. Like uh, last year, there was a talk about uh, fake over-the-air updates being pushed via a uh, just a, a rogue cell tower somebody had in their backpack. Uh, I haven't really seen any much uh, confirmation of that. I just saw a post on a mailing list claiming to have done it, but uh, I, I believe that could be possible. Uh, as I mentioned, Android was affected by Carrier IQ. There's been a plethora of malicious apps which have kind of showed up. And then from the uh, the point of view, you know, you look at the security stuff and you say, well, maybe we should audit it or take a look at it or strip it down to make it uh, a, a simpler base that we can secure better. But then you realize that there's 15 million lines of code just in Android. Uh, and this is the stuff that doesn't include the Linux kernel. There's another 15 million lines of code in the Linux kernel. And uh, as, I, as we've discovered over the course of this project, I'll talk about it a little bit later, it's, it's just not exceptionally well documented. Uh, there's, you got to jump around a lot of places in the source tree. Um, and of course, it's, it's piles and piles of Java, which interlink with C programs, which link back to Java, uh, things like that. It's, it's really quite, uh, quite confusing for one person to all take in and understand, or even a small team. It can be a, a difficult uh, or daunting task. And then my phone, for example, it's a, it's a 1.2 gigahertz processor, it's got 512 megs of RAM. Uh, it still runs like a dog. I mean, it ran like a dog when I got it. Uh, you know, you run a few few apps, and then pretty quick, your memory's all full. Uh, so, maybe you don't want to hack on Android as you know a Java Java environment. But when we looked at it, we really realized that Android is just this pile of user level Java and a few C plus plus demons, all running on top of a Linux kernel. And they've got a little busy box environment down there. Uh, you've got, uh, they've got daemons written in C, which just run for talking to the radio and things like that. And it's pretty standard down there. There's a few tweaks in the kernel, and of course, they have the hardware support and things like that. But by and large, once you get rid of the Java, you're, you're just back down to Linux. So we said, all right, let's scrape all that off, kind of like the, uh, I don't know, you, you don't like mayo on your sandwich, so you just scrape it right off. Uh, so we scrape that off, and now we've got this Linux platform, and sure, it's not driving the screen or anything. We can't get a prompt except through the uh, through the USB port, but we do have that. This means we have a huge variety of hardware sitting there running running Linux. It's got support for the radio now, and um, you know, the drivers have been written. It's just waiting for us to open up and uh, jump in with our own platform. So uh, we we thought, okay, what can we do with this Linux platform we've got here? And uh, we looked, and some of us at work are a fan of uh, of the work of Bell Labs, like Plan 9 and Inferno. And uh, we said Inferno might be a really good fit. So Inferno is this open source operating system written at Bell Labs back in the 90s. It's been maintained since then. Uh, currently, it is owned by Vida Nuova, which is a British company. Uh, it implements a virtual machine. Uh, it's, it's called DIS, and it's compiled and interpreted. Uh, so Inferno can run natively or hosted on top of Linux, on top of Windows, on top of Mac OS. You can, all, you can run it natively on, on hardware directly, but very few people do that because it's so convenient to run it on top of Linux. Um, as, it, as it says, it's, uh, it's inspired by Plan 9. It's kind of a, it was sort of an evolution of some of the concepts taken from Plan 9, sort of with an intention to be used in uh, set-top boxes, uh, embedded devices, and this was back in the mid-90s. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of sort of ahead of its time. It was sort of pushed as a competitor to Java as well because it's a virtual machine. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it actually, the code actually is quite portable, unlike uh, Java code, which you might have to tweak to run on Windows and Linux. Uh, it, it's very portable. It's very lightweight. 
uh, as it says here, it's, uh, it only takes a few megabytes of RAM. I think our environment, uh, you know, you run the Windows system, you run a bunch of demons, you're talking about maybe 16 megabytes of RAM used. And there's about a million lines of code, and this includes, uh, this includes the, the kernel, uh, a whole bunch of applications, uh, you know, the windowing system, a bunch of drivers for native, uh, for use on native hardware, which we don't, we don't even use. Uh, it compiles really fast. You can recompile the kernel in like five seconds on a modern machine. And uh, when, when we, when you run it, it's started up. It's got you into the windowing system within about a second. Uh, so, so this seemed to us, you know, as a really ideal thing to put on top of this Linux system that we've got here. So. You know, you look at you look at the Android thing. We've got we've got this uh, Linux running on Android. It's very basic, but it does provide uh, drivers for all the hardware, including the binary blobs that the manufacturer ship for the radio, which would be we'd basically be completely out of luck if uh, if we didn't have those. So it's not really it wasn't really an option to you know write your own OS from scratch. But building on top of this very thin layer of Linux, it's possible. And um, the neat thing about running it hosted on Linux is it's actually quite easy to update Inferno. Because Inferno just lives in a subdirectory on your uh, on your memory device, so all I all we'd have to do to update uh, Inferno would just be to push the latest copy of, of freshly compiled stuff over to the uh, storage device. So uh, when we were going about this, the first thing we did was, uh, as Shakespeare said, let's kill all the Java. <laughs> and when you look at it, uh, Android's Linux environment is a little bit different, but when it comes right down to it, it you know, it starts a kernel. The kernel loads an init script, and it just part goes through the init script, processing it. Uh, and as we found that every single Java process on the system is launched from one initial process called Zygote. Uh, and if you stop, uh, if you stop Zygote from starting in the init script, which is very easy, you just comment it out. Uh, then the Java environment doesn't launch, and you just have Linux. And so, th so the way to do that, you just take it out of slash init rc. But then you realize slash in it, it or slash is reset on every boot. They reflash it. They reload it from a uh, from storage. Well, and the way to, to fix that is either you can build your own custom ROM, which has in it.rc the way you uh, want, or you can do what we did, which is write a script which grabs the currently running ROM, uh, modifies it, and then reflashes it. Uh, it's, it's very quick, very convenient. Uh, now, now that we had a uh, Linux system. Sans all the Java, we were uh, we were just had to adapt Inferno to actually work on the Android uh, device. Uh, there's there's some hoops you have to jump through in order to actually get it to build because uh, you know, Inferno's got their or sorry, Android has its own set of libraries like Bionic, which is their libc, uh, and so it's a little bit different from GNU libc, which is what Inferno expects. Uh, and there's a script that we found called AGCC, which uh, basically sets up your environment to use the Android GCC. Compilers and tells it where all the libs are. So rather than running GCC, you just run AGCC and it wraps it. Um, we found that most of the existing code for Linux for in Android was suitable for our uses. There were definitely some changes we had to make. Uh, I mean, not a lot of people actually run Inferno on ARM, so there were some uh, there were some issues with the uh, scheduling. And I think we had to tweak some of the assembly because uh, it didn't work on the specific processor models we were using. And then we had to add support for some of the bits of hardware. Uh, we got the frame buffer. I mean, so the nice thing about about uh, the Android Linux is that it just provides a plain old frame buffer on uh, I think it's slash dev slash graphics slash frame zero. Uh, and uh, we we had some code left over from a port of Inferno to the OLPC. We simply adapted that. Uh, it took some tweaking, but we adapted that to our uh, for our use. And then uh, one of the more complex things was uh, figuring out how to parse the touchscreen inputs, because uh, it's interesting they differ from device to device. So yeah, you, you look at uh, the slash dev slash input slash event something, uh, and, and which which event file it is varies from device to device. But you read it, and it gives you a bunch of binary and the format's going to be a little bit different based on which device you're looking at. So basically we just took that and for every device we, you know, we, we had code to handle uh, you know, what, what a, uh, what to parse each touch screen event and convert it to movements of a mouse, movements of the mouse, uh, clicking of the mouse, and uh, things like that. And uh, 
We also got really sick of dealing with uh, with the binary output from these uh, input files, so we just uh, we d we wrote code to convert them to text and make that available to all the other uh, Inferno code. That saved us a lot of time because then we just dealt with text. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. What? Yes. Uh, okay. So he uh, was pointing out that the screen is multi-touch. Uh, what we did here, we didn't want to uh, go all the way in and convert it to a full-on multi-touch system. So basically, we um, let's see if I remember right. There, there's a way to defer uh, differ between the, uh, the the first finger that comes down and the second finger that comes down. We just take a single touch out of this touch screen and treat that as a mouse. Uh, for the way that Inferno is built, or uh, the way it comes, it that's pretty much useful. That's the way you, you kind of want it. Uh, although I think there is certainly possibility for adding multi-touch, we didn't we didn't end up doing that. Uh, and then uh, with that done, with uh, with the graphic support and the uh, some of this hardware support done, we uh, we then had to hack the window manager to make it actually suitable for use with a phone, because as I'll show on the next slide, the old Inferno window manager is just not really suitable for using on a phone. We we tr we played with it for a little bit, but uh, Let's see if I can get my mouse pointer up here. Can you, can you see that? Yeah, okay. So, you know, we've got these little tiny buttons up here at the top of the window for managing the windows. Uh, we've got this little tiny menu down here for opening up, uh, for opening up programs and things like that. We've got little tiny scroll bars, which uh, we've started to do away with but haven't completely done away with. Uh, in the new applications we've written, we have much better scrolling. Uh, so, you know, this is something that's very useful if you have a real mouse, but if you're just Using the touch screen, the inputs look like somebody's you know, poking around at the screen with a sausage. It's just not very good. There's no resolution there. So we hacked on a bit and uh, came up with something that's a lot more phone friendly. Uh, we moved the we moved the basically the start button up to the top, made it a nice big bar for you to hit. We left the uh, the task bar down here at the bottom, but we added a, uh, a battery indicator. Uh, so Unlike Android, we ac we actually do you know Android you can run a bunch of programs at once, but it's kind of hard to tell what's still running and all that. We actually explicitly allow you to uh, to manage your windows uh, by hand because they'll just show up down here at the bottom. Uh, let's see. So yeah, when you click the thing at the top, you get this much more friendly drop down menu. Uh, a lot of these applications are things that were already in Inferno. We've just left them, like the shell. Uh, it's really nice to have a shell, by the way, on your phone, just readily accessible. You can get the same thing in Android, but the the Inferno one is uh, is quite nice. Uh, we we, uh, as I'll show in a bit, we wrote a phone dialer and an SMS application. Uh, let's see. It does come with a browser. It's not a great browser, but it does work. We haven't gone through yet and uh, adapted it to actually make it more touch friendly. So we get little tiny buttons up here and little tiny scroll bars. Uh, oh. But uh, so yeah, we do have we've got some graphical applications that came with Inferno, uh, which is nice. And we do we have an on-screen keyboard, and you access this by pressing the uh, the menu key, the menu button on your phone, which uh, toggles the on-screen keyboard. Uh, we we set up some shortcuts also to manage your Windows. If you press the back button, it kills that application. If you press the home button, it minimizes the application down to the uh, down to the Little bar down here. Uh, we, we've got shortcuts for setting the the screen brightness, things like that, uh, di turning the screen on and off. Um, now, of course, you know, just straight up porting it over, it's porting Inferno over wasn't really enough because it's not really a phone yet. It's just Inferno happening to run on what looks like a PDA now. Uh, so we we wrote a bit of code called Dev Phone, and it uh, it speaks to the radio. So on Android they have something called the RILD, the radio interface layer, I think, daemon. And that you connect to via a socket if I remember right and you send it a very poorly documented set of commands, I think in a binary format. And then it, it does stuff to the phone for you. Uh, so we broke that out. We uh, had one of the interns who did a stellar job at this. He went through all the uh, the RILD code and figured out exactly what it expects, and then he wrote uh, he wrote dev phone for Inferno, 
which speaks to RILD for us so we don't have to deal with it. And what it does is infer within Inferno it presents a little file system interface uh, which we mount at slash phone. And then if you want to make a phone call uh, you just do what I am showing here you can echo dial and then the number into slash phone slash phone. And if you want to receive incoming calls you read from slash phone slash phone. And uh, the read's going to block till a call comes in. And there's a similar interface for SMS in slash phone slash SMS. Uh, you just um, write strings into the SMS file and it sends it out to the, uh, to the appropriate um, recipient. But of course nobody really wants to make a phone call like that. That would really suck if you had to type in all that stupid uh, junk every time you want to make a phone call or receive one, have to have the shell open with a cat slash phone slash phone. Uh, so we wrote a little application to access the phone to do dialing and an SMS application. Uh, we also started working on some Wi-Fi and audio drivers for it. Uh, so you can make phone calls, the audio of, of, of making a phone call is separate from the audio of you know, playing music and things like that. So that works but uh, we had not yet figured out the, uh, the audio thing when the, when the summer completed and we had to uh, send the interns off and stop working on it. So yeah, we've got a very, very primitive dialing application. Definitely could be better, but it allows you to do everything that uh, that you might want: uh, make a phone call, receive a phone call, uh, put someone on speakerphone. And we've got an SMS application. Uh, we we took a very simple approach with this. Just uh, we we just keep the mess the conversation log into in a plain text file. And uh, when a message is received, it's put into that text file. The SMS application pulls on that text, pulls the uh, modification time on that text file. And uh, if it sees something that sees that it's been modified, it rereads it and displays it here for you. Are we getting ringing through the speakers? Because I'm certainly hearing it here. Is there? I don't know how to fix that though. So. Oh, uh, all right. <laughs> but. Uh, and, if, and this SMS application is really quite easy to write because all it has to do is just echo or just write strings into the slash phone slash SMS uh, file and it just takes care of the rest. Uh, oh and you, you can see uh, we, you know we started looking at some ideas on how to make applications in Inferno more phone friendly. So we have these nice uh, nice big scroll bars on the side for your fat fingers and uh, the text is bigger and slightly bigger buttons and things like that. So uh, it's, it's actually not hard, that hard to write a phone friendly application in Inferno. So yeah, as I said we kind of ran out of time. This was a summer project last summer. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Uh, the interns had to leave before we could really get digging into some of the more interesting things we could do with this. But uh, there, there's a few things we thought of might be interesting to look at. Uh, for example, uh, like I said Inferno runs in about 16 megabytes. It's, uh, it's simple enough and small enough that you could run lots and lots and lots of uh, copies of Inferno all at the same time. And uh, you, so you could just have a instance of the OS per application if you want to try sandboxing them that way for instance. Uh, we also thought uh, since we have such good control, we have total control over this operating system right, we uh, it's only about a million lines of code and that's a lot of that stuff we don't even care about. So each one of us who was working on this pretty much understood how the entire system went together, where the kernel was, what, what device drivers were being used, all these things. So we had really strong control of the kernel. So we could implement system level kind of things like uh, security hacks. Uh, something my, my boss had uh, tossed at me was the, uh, the idea maybe if you think you're going to lose your phone and you don't, wanna, you don't want somebody else to get access to the data on it, then you can throw it as hard as you can. And when the accelerometer detects that you've gone over 10 G's, it just completely wipes the SD card. Something like that. And um, something I didn't really mention too much, I did mention that Inferno is based on Plan 9. It's uh, inspired by it in many ways and it uses the same file system protocol, 9P. And uh, there's, there's some really interesting things you can do with 9P because it's, uh, it's when you're working on a system like Inferno because uh, it's network transparent. It doesn't really care where uh, any of these files it's looking at are coming from. So it would be incredibly easy to access the files that you want to store at home. Uh, you don't really need Dropbox, uh, for instance. Uh, you could easily share files with nearby phones. You would just say export this file tree via, I don't know, maybe write Bluetooth driver, 9P over Bluetooth. Uh, you could also use 9P to export your phone's devices very easily. 
um, just say export slash phone slash phone, and then your PC can import those files, mount them, and then suddenly, and then with really no extra code, you can make phone calls from your PC, controlling the uh, controlling the cell phone's radio just from your PC, just by echoing stuff into a command file. Uh, Anti-theft programs are easy. You don't need that um, all the hassle of uh, the, you know. There's a variety of these these things you've seen, right? If somebody steals your phone, you can access the camera, take pictures of them, uh, figure out where he is. Well, it's really easy when you've got 9P. All you do is connect to your phone and uh, mount the devices, mount dev, you know, slash dev slash GPS, mount the mount the camera device, and then uh, you can just access and just take pictures from home and check out where he is. Uh, and besides that, if if, the th if somebody steals your Inferno phone, they're not going to know what the hell. I mean, right? This thing is. <laughs> he's, he'll probably throw it in a ditch, activating the uh, the 10G security uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so the the real thing we we took away from all this is that it's really easy to strip down Inferno and repurpose it for your own uh, whatever you really want to do with it. And I think. I, I couldn't I couldn't really find any references to this, but what uh, one of my coworkers was talking about was a uh, Boeing project which had just done this, a very similar thing. Uh, someone else may know more about this, might point it out after uh, after we're done. But uh, but damn it, we did it first. Uh, and uh, so yeah, if you if you want to strip down an, uh, Android, you don't you don't have to put Inferno on it. It's it's quite easy to uh, to do whatever you want with it. You, you get Linux. You can put Python on there. We did put Python on there. Uh, as a first, you know, first class citizen, you just run Python, and uh, we even we even played around with some Python graphics libraries, which access the frame buffer directly. And we were we were fooling with writing our own. Initially, before we went with Inferno, we were fooling around with writing our own uh, Python environment, and that would be equally easy. Uh, you could you could just whip up your own phone like that. Uh, but what we another thing we took away from it is that actually, with a bit of work, Inferno could be a pretty viable OS for for your smartphone. It's fast. It's light. I mean, uh, when we were testing it, when we managed to crash it, which we did a lot because we were playing with the code, uh, we put in a, a, a key shortcut on the phone for resetting Inferno, restarting just Inferno, and it's you don't even really notice that it's happened, except that you know suddenly all the windows you were running have gone away. It, it happens in the blink of an eye. It's restarted the uh, phone environment, whereas my Android phone takes 30 seconds, a minute to boot up. Uh, it's really easy to work on Inferno because you can understand the entire thing uh, without too much trouble. We had two interns. Uh, I mean we had a high school intern with very basically no coding experience. He figured out how to use the programming language uh, Limbo, and he was writing uh, very some very useful code for us. Uh, you know, within within a, f a few weeks, he understood the OS and the uh, the programming languages was writing good stuff. Um, Inferno already comes with a, a, a bunch of software and some infrastructure put in there. You're not starting over from scratch. You don't have to write any device drivers because they're already in Linux. You just take you just take what Linux has given you and abstract it however you like. Uh, and yeah, there's as I said last, there's a there's no App Store, but uh, I don't really trust what's on the App Store anyway. So. So yeah, if you uh, if you want to play with it, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the code is at, Bit at, at Bitbucket, and you'll probably want to compile it on Linux because that's really the best way to develop for Android and for Inferno. But uh, yeah, so if you want to take a look, go for it. Um, I guess I think I finished quite early. Quite early. Okay. Uh, we have questions. Yes. I'm pretty sure the voice input is a uh, is is in the higher levels of Android, which I think we kill we killed off. Uh, I think that would be that would probably be a bigger project than the whole OS that we just did. I'm sorry, what? I. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was I. I thought you were telling me names, but okay, I got it. <laughs> Well, so we uh, we didn't get time to implement uh, drivers for those, but the thing is, you know, th like like I was saying, the nice thing with Linux is that it's they've already got the drivers implemented. So there's these files in slash dev under Linux, and all we have to do is write code in Inferno to parse what's going into or what's coming out of those files, and then we can present it in however we want. 
So it's it's not much harder than writing a Linux application to access those same resources. Any other questions? Oh. The battery life is uh, stellar. It it just it's not really doing anything. Uh, you know, Android is constantly you know checking a whole variety of stuff. Ours just it just kind of runs forever. Like I I started a uh, I, you know I've, I've left it running for a week, picked it up, and it's still you know still got good battery life. I mean these, we're dealing with Nexus S smartphones here for development, and uh, you know if you've you got the screen off, there's just not a lot of draw there. Uh, any others? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I haven't tried it with Inferno, but um, the the thing is, yeah, you should be able, you should even be able to export export what's on the display, export what's well, if you write a driver for it, exports what's coming in from the camera, uh, export you can export the touch events coming in on the touch screen, you can uh, export the phone files so you can make phone calls, things like that. Uh, it's it's all really easy to just share all these devices. Yeah. Below the what? So uh, Zygote is the first process launched with the uh, with the Dalvik VM, and so it's it, it's sort of like Java's init. You you launch you launch Zygote, which uses the Dalvik, and then it, it launches every every other Java program on Android. Uh, I guess I should have been repeating what questions have been asked before I answer them. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, he was asking, uh, did we change some of the file system permissions to get set up at boot up for Android? Uh, we, uh, we did not. Uh, we, we just left uh, permissions as, as they were. Was there a specific thing you were thinking about there? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the file system, Android's file system is pretty locked down to begin with. I mean, it's, we we were working with rooted phones and we installed cyan well they were the Nexus S so we just unlocked them we installed CyanogenMod, mod um, but we pretty much built on top of a stock CyanogenMod. mod basically I think the only change we had to make was we ran that script which pulled it down modified init.rc and pushed it back up others you have to shout The question was how many people were working on this? There were three, which was myself and two interns, a high school and a college student. Yes. The uh, question was can you still get into the Android, like the Java uh, environment? Yes, you can. Uh, so the script that we wrote to reflash the device with our, uh, with the customized init script, what it actually does instead of calling Zygote, it calls a, uh, it calls a little tiny program we wrote, which basically flashes the entire screen white, leaves it for five seconds. If you touch the screen in that time, it'll switch. It'll start the uh, the Android environment. If you leave it alone, it'll boot into Inferno. Uh, we also I, I didn't show in there, but there's also a menu item in Inferno that lets you switch over to the Zygote environment. You can't switch back though because I don't know how to back out of the uh, the Java. But yeah, it, it's if you want a real environment, not not our uh, our busted development environment. That it's it's pretty easy to do. You haven't bricked your phone. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so the question was, what made us uh, choose Inferno? Well, we're we're all kind of Inferno fanboys at work. Uh, well, th those of us who conceived the project, and uh, we, we were looking for something which would run hosted, which was important. Uh, it's a virtual machine, so it's kind of on par with the Java uh, thing. Uh, we really like the power of the 9P protocol. We we f we find that uh, Inferno's the way Inferno does things is very uh, is very convenient. They have a you know their their way of controlling things through writing just ASCII text to control files is uh, is very convenient for us. It makes it very good for writing applications. Uh, we like the programming language. Uh, I we know personally the people who maintain Inferno right now, so we kind of had it in there. Uh, it, it was really, I think, just a really good fit. We did initially look at, like I mentioned, writing our own Python environment, 
but we we found how easy it was to port Inferno and suddenly have you know the, the, a really good start to an environment already, and so we just went with that. Yes. Uh, so you're asking about which uh, which devices we've had experience with? Uh, well, so we started our work with the Android emulator, which just ships with the SDK. Then we got, uh, I think the first thing we bought were Nook colors, Barnes and Noble Nook colors. We installed CyanogenMod on there and got it ported over to that. And then we also got uh, like five Nexus S phones, and we we did it for that too. Uh, those were the only ones that we had at work, so those are the only ones we ported to. But it really there's not a ton of device specific code for each one. The main thing you're going to be doing is, uh, let's see, you'll probably have to t make some tweaks for like the frame buffer size. Uh, and then you'll have, to, you're probably going to have to write your own touch screen handling code because the, the, the events that come down the pipe are just different for every single thing. Uh, but it, there's not a lot of code. Yes? Well, so we did, I, I did kind of realize that after, uh, at, at when I started talking about the, the shortcuts when I was writing up my slides and stuff, that yeah, that a, lot of a lot of Android smartphones are getting rid of all physical buttons. Personally, I thought the physical buttons were really great because they just gave us this shortcut to give a command directly to the OS no matter what was on the screen. They're getting rid of them. Uh, it wouldn't be a big deal, I think, to add similar on screen buttons to Inferno, say perhaps down in that, uh, in that, that bar at the bottom where all the applications go. Uh, I just wish that they'd kept the physical buttons. Uh, any more? Am I missing anybody? All right, I, th I think that might be it. All right, thank you guys.